All right, ladies and gentlemen. So we are officially live right now. This is going to be a podcast between me, Nick, and Colin. Do you do you want to introduce yourself, Colin? I think people know Nick by this point. Yeah. So for those of you who are in the Facebook group, you may or may not know me. Uh, my name is Colin Killian. I've been following Jer here for a few years now. It's actually his content that really helped me start initiating through the clip off. So uh, let's go a little bit into my backstory. You know, born and raised right here in Florida, a few a few miles down from Jer, honey. And my my practice is very uh, eclectic in nature. I pull from a lot of different pantheons, do a lot of chaos magic, and ultimately, really just I, I focus on the evolution of both myself and those around me mm. through multiple methods. Very cool. Very cool. So. So let's let's jump off right there. Um, how how long have you been have you been practicing within the occult? So it's been on and off since I was in high school. Actually, it all started off with me getting a basic little um, how do you? It's like a little potion put together by a witch friend I had to basically start ward to ward off like entities I would see in the house. I would see shadows in the corner of my vision, walking just going around. Um, growing up, actually, you know, I've always been surrounded by the paranormal, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I lost my dad to cancer in 2009 when I was 11 years old, right? He died in the mm -hmm. house. And a few years later, my, my mom starts to decide, he decides to start dating again. And my stepdad, one day, he's sitting underneath this cabinet on the wall. It was drilled into the, into the, into, you know, into the studs. It wasn't going anywhere. He's sitting there working on his laptop, and next thing you know, I hear a crash from upstairs. And I go downstairs, I see the cabinet had fallen down onto his head, and it almost killed him. Totally obliterated his laptop. And like, it was, and then we looked at the, we looked closer at the cabinet, and there were handprints on top. So I've always had, you know, just strange encounters with paranormal stuff just from a young age. So. Mm. I've Getting into the occult, you know, fast forward to today, it's something that I've been able to actually adapt to relatively quickly, all considering. Um, I know a lot of people take a lot of time to adapt, say they're coming from like an atheistic standpoint, or they're coming from like a really deep rooted Christian standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, you know, I was born and raised Christian Pentecostal, grew up in churches, people were speaking tongues, kind of surrounded by more of the of the so-called woo-woo stuff if you will mm -hmm. so so that's something i've always been around in my life so it's really kind of shaped me into who into who i am especially you know with me losing my dad at a, at a young age i've ha i've had close brushes with death throughout my life and that's ultimately mm -hmm. shaped my practice into what it is right now so i actually have a goal to basically revolutionize the mental health care system in the uh, just right here in the u.s at some point in time because a lot mm. of because i noticed i noticed as, um, as someone who's been in and out of that system especially while i was actually initiating through the clip off starting off i noticed there's a lot of people who are actually going through like unconscious possession while they're in that system right mm. and you know i've i've used some of the techniques that you show on your patreon actually while i while I was in those places and I noticed how it would influence the energy, the ebbs and flows of energy in the place. Like there was this one dude, he was apparently going around cursing people in Arabic. And I basically sent a little something at him and not even five minutes later, he's <laughs> getting beat up by somebody else. It was, mm. it was a pretty crazy experience. Interesting. Interesting. So then, so let's go into that piece then that's, and I'm glad that you shared what you just shared on kind of like a little bit of your background and sort of how your dad passing away leading to like supernatural phenomena happening in the house is kind of what prepped you for being aware that there's stuff outside of just the physical. Right. Um, and now you are where you are now. How old are you, Colin? Just turned 25 last week on Saturday. Oh, congratulations and happy birthday. Thank so you. 25 years old, now you're a practicing occultist taking your practice pretty seriously. You have a big goal of wanting to revolutionize the mental health field. Um, how did how did you get into 
the darker aspects of the occult in regards to what you just explained with being in one of these mental health institutes, sort of observing someone uh, acting in a very crazy way, um, using what sounds like dark energy unconsciously, and then you kind of used conscious dark energy, if you will, and triggered something in this guy. What has led you to that? So it's a, it's a crazy story, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's the kind of stuff you can't make up, right? So back in 2020, um, 2019, 2020, it was really about around the start of my spiritual awakening. So it was like late 2019, early 2020 around that time. So around July of 2020, I was in San Diego at the time. Mm. And I and I had been working with this lady named Karen O'Malley. She used to go by Karen Terrace. Uh, okay. She originally went by uh, the Dragon Doula. She goes by something else now. She's doing something that she basically initiated me into the in, into magic, into the occult, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, I had paid her uh, a pretty significant uh, sum sum of money to basically invoke one of the deepest aspects of my soul to connect me to that. And so I, mm. so, that I could, so that I could ultimately start growing into my potential. And so she did that. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> okay. Can you, can you actually go into that a little bit? What, it, can you talk a little bit about like what she did and how she brought yeah. this part of your, your soul up? That's interesting. Yeah. So basically what she did, um, if you're, if you, if any of you guys are familiar with um, Dungeons and Dragons, right? You have the class of cleric, mm. where cleric they basically communicate with spirits and different spiritual energies. So okay. She kind of act, acted like almost like that, right? Uh, tapping into my energy and then basically running me through a visualization of connecting to a different uh, some sort of star system where I guess there was a link to my soul there. Um, mm. Lyra specifically, it was connected to the star system of Lyra. Yep, and I'm basically just sitting there, on a, and she's uh, she's basically you know it's, it's kind of reminiscent of what I grew up with uh, in the Pentecostal church. She was basically singing in these tongues. Some people call it light language, mm. um, and I'm just basically sitting there basking in it. And you know, not even like the week following that, right? Just a whole lot of chaos ensued. Basically, just opened this door to a maelstrom of chaos where I was like, me- like mentally, like I'm getting all, like, I'm, get- I'm getting all of this gnosis coming in and I have, I have no idea what gnosis really even was before then. So I'm getting like mm-hmm. all these different thoughts, I- ideas, like uh, knowledge about how the world works and it's extremely overwhelming. It was, mm. it was, uh, it, it, it that's, that's what drove me into psychosis a few times. And you see that oh, wow. happen. You see that ha- you see you see that happen a lot in the occult with people who they uh, like. I I had what you could describe as a premature Kundalini awakening, mm-hmm. essentially. So that basically drove me into psychosis, and mm. I ended up like like I was I was really fitting into that good shepherd archetype. Like I want to save the world. I want to you know I want I want to save all these people from their from their from themselves, and yeah, you know. I had to learn the hard way that, you know, any, every time you do that, you're, you're, you're literally shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. And let's, let's actually, let's make sure. So everyone knows that's listening to this, like what the good shepherd is. Do you, Nick, do you want to kind of go into that a little bit? Yeah. So we can see the good shepherd archetype firsthand, really in any person that's kind of like wanting to save the world. So a lot of us, when we have like a spiritual awakening, we we see all these changes that could be made in the world. And typically we're like, okay, well, what, what can we do to, to really save the world in some way? So we may, you know, truly put out this huge effort in, in trying to make changes in the outside world. But in reality the way that the matrix is kind of set up it's set up to have that that savior archetype when they 
when they get to a certain point, typically they'll get sacrificed. And it kind of, it relates strongly to kind of the Jesus Christ archetype, how he was sacrificed on the cross. So that's kind of the, the energy that you're tapping into when you kind of do that thing where you, you're trying to save the world, you know, and we're in reality, who really needs to be saved is ourselves. And we're always trying to fix the outside world, but we're not really ever focused on ourself. So every time we do, you know, try to focus on that outside thing that needs to be fixed, that's when we end up kind of shooting ourselves in the foot, you could say. And that's kind of a, a, a brief explanation. Um, if you want to go into it a little bit more. Well, I actually want to, I actually want to add on to that. So there's a distinction in the little connection that I uh, was able to make, right? So you have Jesus you know, dying on the cross for everybody's sins. Everybody knows that part. And then, you know, he rose three days later. But a lot, what a lot of people don't pay attention to is the transfiguration, right? Where he's there with like his uh, disciples and whatnot. And he, but um, I've heard it described by other occultists, basically, that was him crystallizing his aura and essentially becoming immortal. And that's how he was able to rise from the dead after he was uh, crucified, right? So is by is by what having the disciples? No, by uh, trans. It was called the transfiguration, where he basically crystallized his aura. And what? But what? So what crystallized his aura? That's my question. So, so that was basically him raising his consciousness, and we can describe it as essentially raising the kundalini, and getting to a level of consciousness to where he basically became aware of the fact that he was that he was God. Right, it, it manifests in human form, and that from there he basically crystallizes his aura. And it, uh, there's, there's, um, you guys can do your uh, some, some research on that yourself as well. Um, if you follow Damien Eccles, uh, he actually goes into that a little bit himself in one of in some of his videos. Yeah, yeah, and 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 this is the thing about Jesus. He was Jesus at at some point in time was a real human being who had a lot of skills, a lot of gifts, right. a strong spiritual connection. And he was not the same person that we hear about in, in modern time uh, religious texts today. Yeah. Um, I believe in many ways people do look at Jesus as almost like the perfect human being. And in reality, there's absolutely no such thing as a perfect human being. Jesus was not right. the perfect person. He made mistakes. And yeah. I personally do believe, um, and it actually, if anyone has read the book, The Law of One, it actually talks a little bit about uh, Jesus back in that time. And they said that his name was referred to as Yeheshua. And yeah. he wasn't a perfect human. And he actually kind of leaned a little bit too far into martyrdom to the point where that's where the whole story of his, his sacrifice comes yeah. from, which comes from a pure place, but ultimately wasn't the best decision to make and you kind of look at how it trickled down into 2023 modern times where right. it's actually become an intentional program that's ran on the mass collective to lead people into martyrdom self-martyrdom under the guise of saving other people for their karma or their sins right and, and, the whole, it, and his, mm -hmm. his whole his whole original intention Really looking into um, there's this other guy I talked to, Michael Johnson, I believe is his name, another cultist. He actually is a biblical scholar, and he was basically I was talking with him the other night, and he basically mentioned how, you know, he what he wasn't here to you know go die on a cross so everybody could be free. Those no, he was here to show people that they too can do what he was doing, show people that there yes you can access this power. This is what you're, you're we are all capable of this, but you know the church and spun it around and we have what we have today mm. hey uh hey did we uh i think we lagged out for a second did you did you guys did it lag out for you guys too or was it just me where did it uh, lag out at? might have been just to you oh well it, i just for it, everything just froze and then it popped in and you guys were just kind of sitting there <laughs> so i you were you were just talking about jesus calling and you were you were talking about how he his main and his, his you were talking about his real intention and then that's right when it cut out for me yeah so his damn that's <laughs> so his real intention was essentially to show people that everything that he, he was doing that they can do as well 
mm-hmm. you know, he, he, it even says that, you know, it's somewhere in the Bible, it's like the works I have done, you can do and more. So, yep. you know, he was primarily a healer. He was going around healing people, curing them of disease, you know, fixing their eyes and vision and all that. And he was basically here to show people like, okay, hey, you don't have to worship this God. You can become like me. Yeah. Which I found, I found kind of fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that is a really, that's a really cool thing about um, Jesus in the sense that at its truest core, it was, this was a very, a very helpful human, right. For, for right. On, on many, on many levels. And it's, and yeah, he definitely, he was, he was a very powerful healer. Um, he understood the emotional nature of disease. So it's not that he was healing people. It's that he was teaching people about the emotional root causes of their illness. And as he was teaching them and educating them, he was in many ways able to guide them through the processing of the emotion, which then led to the heal of the disease. Yep. And that's how people thought he was a miracle. People thought he was a God. They thought he was a miracle worker. And then that's why he got a lot of um, you know, bad rap with that the, the society at that time. Um, right. But it's it's so fascinating to see how they and and this is kind of like we're 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 on a little side tangent from our original, uh, what we were originally talking about. But it's kind of cool that we're going down this rabbit hole. It's it's interesting to see how the whole story of this this truly helpful human being has turned into something very demonized um, in our modern time, where you have a lot of people that don't like Jesus just because of the religious dogma and programming that's behind it. Uh, understandably, because there's a lot of trauma that a lot of us go through being yeah. raised in religious families. You know, we get raised by a religious family that forces Jesus down our throat and you have to be this way. If you're not this way, then that, that's a sin. This is bad. And then we grow up and we start hating Jesus and we don't even know why we actually hate Jesus. We really just hate the religious trauma that we went through. Right. And so not it's interesting. Not, and not only does this happen to Christianity, this, this happens in, in Islam as well. You have kids who mm-hmm. are basically raised and they're it's beaten into them to read and memorize the Quran. And so whenever they are, you know, a lot, not, some of them don't really get out of that, but those that do, they, they come to resent all of religion and they basically turn either you know, agnostic or atheist. Yeah. 100%. 100%. And, and, and there's a lot of, there's value in all religions it's just how are you working with the religion and right. the truth is in in every religion there is often going to be a deep rooted subtle intention that's designed to act as an attachment for your trauma so with all the rule systems and the guidelines a lot of them can be helpful based around certain cosmic laws in, based around nature, whereas a lot of them can be very confining, very rigid, yeah. and very easy to latch onto to say, this is good, this is evil. Anything outside of these guidelines is evil. Anything in these guidelines is good. Now that programs us in a dualistic way, and we start living our life programmed. Right. And, you know, this might this might be very unpopular for some people who are really into the dark arts. Like I still practice them myself. However, I also still I still work with the archetype that is the Christ archetype, right? Because there is a lot of value of basically understanding deeper knowledge of how to heal yourself there through just understanding your emotions, understanding that yes, someone is projecting an attack out onto me, but I don't have to necessarily respond. Because if someone is able to invoke anger within me after you know coming at me in a very harsh way, well, that basically gives them a mean that, that gives them a form of control over me because they're controlling they're they're, they're, tur- they're turning that anger they're projecting it onto me and now I'm also becoming angry, and so it's a it's a form of control ha- they have over me now. So really, in one way, to, it, yeah, mm-hmm. in one way, in one way. So like you can still get you can still get angry, you can feel that anger, but you don't have to really seep into it and lash back, lash that back out. You can feel it, be there with it. And then if you have a very well regulated uh, nervous system, you're then able to let it go in a healthy manner, whether that is set, setting up a simple boundary, whether that is something a, a little bit more on the, like uh, on the psychic warfare side of things, however that is. But mm-hmm. 
I always, with people that, are, if I'm at, uh, in a real world situation and I encounter a person that's being disrespectful, I always treat them with the kind of respect that I would like to be treated as. Obviously, it doesn't happen like that all the time because there are some people that kind of make me snap. And mm-hmm. that, that's, that's something that I still have to work on myself. But overall, I usually will treat the person with kindness and respect, treat them how I would want to be treated, which is with respect and kindness. And basically just killing killing them with kindness. And if they keep on having at it, then I, you know, I escalate. I put my foot down, my hey, knock that off. I'm not messing with that. Like if they keep on doing it, you know, it's it's you know, it's fuck around to find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's that's really cool that you brought that up because that's a that's a big thing I think a lot of people struggle with is navigating um anger specifically as an emotion. Um, because it's, it's tricky, you know, it's, it's not black and white. It's, it's easy for us to think it's black and white. And I've, I've fallen into that many times myself where it's like, okay, you know, someone, someone triggers me, I feel anger. So in my past, my, I had a very abusive father. So I was shut down every time I experienced anger around him. So when I first started snapping, that's what gave me power. It like became my like, first authentic expression with this emotion that I hadn't experienced in years. So that was very healthy. The fact that I was expressing it and I was actually snapping for the first time and I was putting up my boundaries, but then it got out of balance where I started identifying with it. And I started saying, you know what? One's ever going to come against me again. No one's ever going to disrespect me. I'm going to cross this boundary. I'm always on top of it. And then that became its own identity. And then you know, funny enough how the universe functions. It's like you attract two things at all times in your life. You attract like-minded individuals and you attract the opposite. And it's like when I was in that energy of finally expressing and experiencing my aggression, I would, in many ways, I would attract other, you know, aggressive people that would come to me. And then we'd have like altercations or our egos would battle and it just kind of fueled the fire. And then I would attract the complete opposite. Like a lot of times it came through women. It would just be these, these, these women that were just so like in their feminine energy, like don't give a shit, you know, just, just with the flow. And I'm just like looking at it, like thinking at the time, like, how could you be like that? That's so, that's not right. Or that's so dangerous. That's unconsciously what I was doing. That's so dangerous. That's so not safe. When in reality, that's literally all I wanted to do was just let go of that anger. And my reality was showing that to me. So working with emotions is very subtle and it's very dynamic. And there is times where we need to snap and we need to express ourselves, and we need to go with that and, and set that boundary. Then there's times where we need to recognize, okay. And, w- and, and this is the interesting part. The more self-aware you become, the more you actually feel your emotions, the more you will naturally be able to tell what your body's trying to do with you. So- you will know when it's time to actually express the anger and set the boundary. And you'll know when it's time to just feel the anger, let go and be receptive. And that those right. times will fluctuate through the journey. Right. And when it comes to being receptive and really feeling it, right. I've noticed that when it comes to primarily anger, forgiveness is a very key component to basically releasing and alchemizing that anger into essentially love and your own personal power and evolution because think of it like this let's say you have a water gun i'm coming up with this on the spot you have a water gun and it's full of water that water is your anger so anytime someone pisses you off they do this or something like something else and it's out of their own unconscious awareness and they're not even aware if they're fully doing fully aware if they're doing it right and then you lash out while well, you're squeezing that water gun and you're letting that anger out you're you're you're, you're lowering the, the ammunition capacity of that water gun. So what happens when you forgive? Well, now you're able to basically reserve that ammunition in there and you're able to you know, add it to your own personal stockpile for where you, when, when you really need it. So ultimately being able mm-hmm. to control it in a way where you have your anger reserved for those situations where it is absolutely necessary to use. But at the mm-hmm. same time being able to, so but let's say, you know, someone, I'll give an example from my job, right? I work construction. Usually you have a lot of aggressive people in construction. Yep. So 
you know, one of my coworkers, one this this one morning, I w- I wasn't I wasn't having it. I was you know, had a headache. I ran out of, I ran out of my vitamins, so my my uh, micronutrients were a little a little low, and I was kind of kind of irritable that morning. And I, and I also had acid reflux as well. There's a, a, mm. a few different things going on. And we're driving to this spot in, uh, at the work site. And he basically is like, hey, can, he's basically like, can you stop driving like a damn grandma? And I'm like, and I really snapped on him. I'm like, hey, can you shut the fuck up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, all right. <laughs> and he, and he, but, it, but usually he he rags on me like that all the time. And you know, it, it, it's funny, usually. It, it, he's joking around. He doesn't, he doesn't really mean it. That one, that one time, this is getting really annoying to me. I told him, hey, just shut the fuck up, man. Yeah. And that's so that's so cool, though, how you were able to listen to your body and and not psych yourself out and prevent yourself from actually feeling the emotion because you know in your regulated state it's like you understand that's just how he is that's his that's probably his behavior because of the stuff he's been through his coping mechanism was probably being the funny guy and yeah. you know generally when you're when you're in that regulated state it's like okay you know jokes 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 it just keeps things alive and fun yeah. but then when you're having the day where like we all do, we have days where we're dysregulated. No one's perfect. Everyone yep. has their days when it's like some everything's off and it's it's a part of the growth process. And he says what he normally says, but this time it's being registered in a different way. It's like, okay, I don't want this today. My boundary is this. And you right. express that and that's extremely healthy. And that's why this process isn't just black and white. And right. Also, what you said earlier about the water gun analogy, that's a great analogy. Um, Anger, a lot of people don't know this, but aggression and anger is literally connected to our life force, our power, our purpose, our passion, our drive, and our money. So if you're lacking the ability to express anger in a healthy way, um, you're going to lack all these different qualities. So if you're over attached to anger and everything's triggering you, you're wasting that that water reserve in the water gun, which is your life force, your vitality, your all those things. Where when you have a healthy expression for it, you use creative outlets, or you can learn to channel it in a way where you're not necessarily angry because of something triggering you. You're expressing that aggression through the form of passion in purpose where it's like this this energy is just shooting out so when i make content a lot of my content comes from that space of like healthy aggression and it, it i make a lot of money doing it and it's a healthy outlet doing it and it feels good and i'm not just sitting there like fuck the right fuck the left you know all these people are are whatever you know politics i don't get stuck in that rat race you know yeah. Definitely. While we're on that topic, though, I do want to bring this up. I know I know a lot, a lot of people in the in the, in the occult community don't like to get political. However, you know that there is a, a thing, um, is a topic you can look it up on YouTube. It's called conscious politics, where you're really able to develop a deeper understanding of people as a whole and the way people think, why they think the way they think. It really, if, if you really, if you have a, well, if you really like to understand people and how they think. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's just a good avenue to explore if you enjoy that mm. kind of thing like I do. Because I'm personally into psychology, really into psych- human psychology and just seeing see what makes people tick. So that's personally up my alley. If you are into psychology, it might be up yours. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, I was going to say, you- um, like working out and finding ways to express yeah. that anger energy, yeah. such as working out or doing like MMA or karate or any type of those outlets, those would be really good ways to express that anger in a powerful way. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. MMA. Let me, let me touch on that. MMA. That's a great one because MMA is, and I did, I did, uh, I did, uh, boxing and Brazilian jujitsu for six months. So I'm no expert on this, but I did it for six months in 2020 or two, yeah, 2020. And it's an amazing, like amazing form to learn how to work with your aggression in a healthy way. Because me being there for six months, I was going consistently. And in that six months time frame of being there, there was literally, I want to say 20 students that would, that have come in and then left like the next week. 
cycling through. And what, what the common pattern that I was able to observe, because obviously going into these practices as an observer or as someone that's doing self-development, you learn so much more than the average person. I could see that the reason why people were leaving is because the newcomers always are like the baby snake. So if you don't understand the, the analogy, baby snakes, they don't know how to control their venom. So when they bite, they release all their venom, whereas the adults, they know to reserve it. So they only insert enough to kill the prey and they keep the rest. So what would happen in, in this uh, gym that I would go to is these students would come in and they're in this fir- they're in this position for the first time they've probably ever been in in a very long time where they're actually in a th- potentially threatening position where we're actually we're rolling on the mats to the point where one of us is going to get choked out. And the you could see the nervous system response in these students that were unexperienced and were new, which is very natural. I was the exact same way where you're fighting for your life. So you have everyone else in the gym that has experience and has been doing it consistently. We're rolling like it's a dance. We're, we're playing it like it's like after my f- first month, second month being there, it became like a dance. Oh, okay. I'm not actually here to kill you. You know what I mean? Like we're just having fun, but the person who's new is literally doing it as if they're going to die. And the way that they're coming at you is like their anger is coming up to the surface, probably for the first time in a long time, trying to survive completely. And you would deal with that in all these different students. And guess what happens? You get shown that's not you 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 get proved very quickly that that's going to get you killed especially in a gym of trained professionals that know how to literally take someone's life using the body and they would strategically pair i remember with me they cuz i was in that same state i was like fighting for my life they paired me with the the literally the hardest guy in the class just to show me a lesson and i was exerting all my energy trying to win against him and it was like he was just, it was like he was blinded watching a TV show. That's how little effort he was putting in, torturing me, like literally torturing me, flipping me upside down. And it, it shocks, it shocks you. It shocks your ego. It shocks your entire worldview. And it makes you realize if I'm going to survive against this, I have to learn how to one, work with my anger, work with my survival energy, work with this aggression in a different way. Cause it's like, I'm, it's almost like I'm showing all my cards and that's what it felt like. I showed all my cards. I I put everything on the line and they just read the table and they just ended me where after that experience, I was like, you know what? I need to reserve this energy. I need to kind of like learn how to be more receptive and not get so aggressive and that's something that I definitely learned from a practice like that. So for anyone that's here, yeah, that, that is absolutely a great avenue to learn how to understand your own aggression. 100%. And as someone who did martial arts growing up, I, I agree with what you're, you're saying 100%. I didn't do a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or kickboxing, but I did something called Weishi Ru. It's a Okinawan karate. And mm. you know, I, w- I would just practice my katas and you know, just do the regular regular stuff and then it came a day actually came where i had to use it at school this back in middle school this kid decided to you know, he was already messing with me a little bit as it is i didn't really pay too much mind to it he was just doing his thing i didn't really care and then one day he decided to throw a punch at me and i immediately just instinctually reacted i was able to cast a punch to basically redirect him around and basically held him there in a the headlock until the teacher came and take him away mm, that's that's interesting you say that and uh is isn't that a beautiful thing when you when you go through training and then it actually shows up in the real world? The same thing happened to me the next year in 2021 when I moved to San Diego. There was a guy that um, disrespected me, and I responded. And actually, I did get triggered when he disrespected me. And it was one of those days where I was just I was already upset, and I I believe in many ways I manifested the whole situation because I was already upset from something else. And then it led to this next experience. But for me, it was actually one of those healing experiences where I, I was glad I got triggered. I'm, I was glad I went with it because there's a certain trauma that I went through in, in high school for me uh, where I actually got into a fight with a kid in school and it didn't really go the way that I wanted it to because I was going through some stuff at that time. I, was, I took Xanax and it just altered my state. A lot of stuff went wrong. 
And there was a trauma there from that because I, I've gotten in fights before and I didn't lose. So that fight, I felt like I lost and that traumatized me in a way. And then this experience that manifested years down the road um, after I had done training with martial arts, it gave me like that sense of knowing, like, you know, I'm, I, I'm, no one's going to, you know, disrespect me without me at least honoring, you know, what's going on and, and being true to myself. This guy disrespected me. Um, I disrespected him back. My first response wasn't to like fight him or anything at all. Actually, it was just, you disrespect me. I'm going to disrespect you. I'm not going to take it and just pretend like it, you didn't say anything. I said what I said. He got triggered again. And he said, hey, let's take it to the alleyway. And I said, let's go. Met him in the alleyway. We we squared up. He came at me and I put him on the ground in probably three seconds, had him on the floor, punching him in the face. I even have a scar on my knuckles from it. Uh, yeah, I've got a scar that that reminds me of it for the rest of my life. But it actually, after it happened, and it was really interesting, it was so easy to take him down. It was the, it was, it, it, in my mind, I was prepared to like really tussle with this guy. And it just, it happened so effortlessly that I was like, wow. Like I felt mercy when I was on top of him. I, I felt like, okay, I don't have to hurt him any harder, like anymore. Like I can, I can pull back now. Like I, I displayed my power and that's what I needed yeah. for myself. And then I got off of him. And I just told him, I said, like, don't ever, don't ever disrespect me again. And he learned his lesson and I went about that. And then, but it gave me time to actually reflect on that past trauma I had and then reconnect everything. And then after the experience, that ang that, that charge of anger was, was gone. It was for the most part, like it, it got out of my body. And once again, the training that I did prepared me for that time to almost heal that trauma. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's cracking a little joke here. Carrying the mind for me was a little stable button. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. what I felt like. And 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 even on a spiritual front, check this out. So um I I was at that time I was wearing this ring. This is like the ring that I, I wore, I've worn from the beginning of my in, initiations. I've seen, I've seen that in videos of yours in the past. Yeah. Yep. I, this was my first I, ring in the occult. I think I saw you wearing that ring on the first video I ever saw of you where you were talking. You probably did. You definitely probably did. And when I was fighting him, this ring fell off of my finger and it was in the spot that we fought, but I didn't notice it. So I went and I was walking and then I looked down and my ring wasn't there. And this ring means a lot to me. So I went right back and I got my ring. And as I went to go get it again, I realized I'm like, that's so something about that was so symbolic because like, obviously this is a skull. And that's, yeah. that's like the essence of death and then rebirth and, you know, moving out of the old, stepping into the new. And that's, that's literally what it felt like for me. It was like, Hmm, something, something had processed from that moment. So the ring, I, I the, the ring, I never take off for anything ever. This, this is very, uh, a constant reminder for me is the yin and yang. Mm. Always a reminder to maintain a state of balance. I love that. I love that. Do you, Nick, do you have any like rings or tools that, that represent any of those things to you as well? Yeah. Um, so I have uh, several power rings. Um, I guess my favorite one is the dragon. That one is kind of represents like Asmodeus and it represents like pulling in all that chaotic energy and like that hatred, that anger, that rage, and just being able to channel it like in a in a powerful way, being able to channel it into like work or art or, you know, whatever that is, but because there's so much of it in the environment, you know, we can become so mm -hmm. affected by all the chaos. Sorry. And so something like that is very powerful. Um, but yeah, they all have a, a pretty significant meaning this one's a citrine. I just got that one. And that's ah. kind of like a, a Lucifer stone. And it's multifaceted and it has the a point at the bottom. So it's kind of like sending the energy right in. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of just intuitive with like the rings and stuff like that that I get. Do you have them on like certain fingers representing certain like 
parts of the body? Like, do you like, do you know why you have that one on your pointer finger compared to the other ones? Um, or is that so, unconscious? Yeah. For me, it's more like, I kind of like, well, my, I might put them on different fingers. I'm like, okay, that feels right. You know, and then I'll yeah, yeah. feel uncomfortable if I put it on a, a different finger. So it's kind of more just intuitive in that way. But I'm sure if I really thought about it, there's a much deeper like re yeah. uh, reason behind that. So I did a yeah. post in the, I did a post in the Facebook group a few months ago on a palmistry, in the ring that I had at the time with the moon. And I put it on the index fingers because the um is basically the whole internal solar eclipse that well, I, won't, I won't go into a spiel about that but basically what i have now is on my left hand i have my sun sign of virgo mm. on on the sun on, on the sun finger and then i'll see balance on the on the, on the on the other finger here and then i don't know really, really know what the moonstone here correlates with it's more of an unconscious thing but it just feels right there okay i love it i love it and and that's it's a cool thing about rings because or rings in general and then and then like the placements we we tend to put these things on our body is like i you know during my beginning initiations with the clip off i actually attracted someone into my life that played a very significant role in how i understood spirituality as a whole and he this guy his name's gabriel and he is he's like one of the most shamanistic people that i know of to the point where he's like a lot of people would think he's kind of like woo woo but he's also got that very grounding energy too like like you know he's there you get he's there yeah. and for me i could i that's the kind of person i jive very well with like i i totally understand him and i get what he's talking about but it's sometimes what he says is like stuff that blows my mind it's like you know like you talk to someone and you know they're, they're literally pulling from a whole different space it's like they're speaking from the subconscious and it's like yeah. there's no logic to like make sense out of it but you actually get it unconsciously that's what he does all the time with me. And I just remember he would have all these rings and it's like, he almost had different rings every like month, every single month. It was like different rings on his hand. And he would always like, he basically programmed into my awareness. He was like, nothing that he did was too, too logical. It was not too strategic. Everything was intuitive. So he would literally have this one ring on this finger. Then he would flip it upside down and put it on the same finger. And he, and he but, but he would explain to me what it meant to him. And the way he explained it was very grounding. It was like, wow, like I can actually understand that and how that actually affects your reality. And it 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 taught that to me. Like all this stuff is so intuitive and the body, you know, is the vessel for our higher self. And when it wants to do things, the best thing that we can do is allow it to do those things. Now we may gain knowledge and we may gain a perspective on what this means and then we try to take advantage of that and that's that's wonderful but sometimes the body and the higher self communicate outside of that realm of logic and we don't yeah. want to get stuck between our logical mind and our higher mind and prevent ourselves from doing something that is probably intuitively best for us because the logic and the knowledge of the book says we need to do it like this 100%. so i yeah, yeah, I thought I'd share that. But okay, so we we went off on this huge tangent. So let's yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna reel it all back in and we're gonna we're yeah. gonna pick up where we actually left off because I like to kind of uh dot my my uh I like to dot, dot my eyes and cross my T's. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um so I, so we were talking, Colin, about how you were getting into the darker aspect of the occult. And we mentioned the good chef. You mentioned the good shepherd archetype, and that's yep. where we kind of went off on the tangent. Yeah. So, let's so, pick up back on that. So it was around this time I was unconsciously initiating through the Sephiroth. I was actually in the process of crossing the abyss of the Sephiroth when I first encountered your YouTube channel, and that was the first video I saw of yours. Actually, because I was I, I I had heard the concept of crossing the abyss through um, I think it was either a Netflix series called The Midnight Gospel with uh, Duncan mm -hmm. Trussell or something like that. But Duncan I guess, Trussell. Or, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a comedian. He's, actually been, yeah. he's, been, he's been on Joe Rogan a few times too. Yep, I know. Yeah. So I'm, it, was, it was his show on Netflix and he was talking um, on, basically he, he took his podcast and he turned it into a cartoon, mm. which, is, which is a really cool concept in and of itself. But um, he was talking with Damien Eccles, a member of the West Memphis Three. You guys can look that up for if you if for you true crime fanatics. That's a whole case in and of itself. 
I'm mm. keeping on track here. So I heard him mention something about crossing the abyss, either within that, or maybe I got curious about the name, looked it up, and I saw it in one of his videos. But I, I looked at Damien Eccles, and he had mentioned crossing the abyss. And that was my first real introduction to uh, Kabbalah, actually, because actually in that show, it had like a whole, it had, um, you know, it had the Kabbalistic tree here, but it was like, it was like animated, it was like live and moving around. I'm like, what is that symbol? Mm. Oh, so they actually included that, that symbol in his podcast. Right. And in, in, in the, in the whole, sh in, in the cartoon, they included the Kabbalistic tree. It was like animate and had a personality. It was kind of weird, but funny, but <laughs> you know, getting off track here, I heard him mention something about crossing the abyss and mm. some, something about that really just resonated with me where it's like, you know, that's what I feel like I'm actually going through right now. Mm -hmm. And I had no clue how to process it, where I was. I was like, simply put, from the moment that I had the whole uh, invocation, it was, it was called a bespoke dragon invocation with Karen. The, the moment I had ha I had that with her, that basically, you know, it one she you know she re revealed to me uh, a, a, like basically a name uh, that was very deeply connected to my soul, if not was a big large part of my soul. And that basically triggered my crossing of the abyss. Mm, so almost like she connected you with literally like potentially a name of uh, a part of yourself that literally exists in a higher dimension. Exactly. Like a, like the higher self. And then, right. Right. That's, 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 that's exactly what happened. And so it mm. triggered a crossing of the abyss. And simply put, I was lost in the abyss for three years. <laughs> not knowing oh. what to do mm. can you uh, can you describe that can you describe what that feels like to kind of be in that state where you felt like you were lost in the abyss yeah so the feeling of being lost in the abyss i kind of i kind of touched up on it briefly earlier without any context behind it but i basically i had all this gnosis coming and all this knowledge you know doc the mm. sphere of knowledge the hidden sphere of knowledge so i have all this mm. knowledge coming in coming in coming in and I'm constantly having to like go outside, walk, ground it, mm -hmm. all this just beautiful knowledge. That, and like I had, at that time, I had like a really just gluttonous thirst for knowledge. So like all this stuff's coming in. I'm encountering all these different things on the internet. Um, there came about a about half a year later, where I was, you know, the same lady who introduced me to that. She showed me this book called The Sophia Code by mm -hmm. Kaya Ra. And that was a interesting experience in and of itself with, which came with it its own uh, <laughs> psychotic, like, like psychosis episodes. It was like, it, it was like, like that book was basically like a streamlined spiritual awakening and for spiritual awakening, introducing you to all these different entities, invoking them without really knowing what you were consciously doing. Like that, like that book is actually like, I think that book is actually a legitimately dangerous, dangerous book for people who are new to this field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you're basically reciting these rituals that are written in this book right yeah. and you're invoking all these different energies and i was doing like back to back one after another like let's go next one and guess and what like, guess what just to add on that you're you're probably one of billions of people that have done that and i i see it all the time and i i mean i'm a proponent of it as well of getting coming across occult information, not knowing what exactly it's it's going to trigger into my life, and right. thankfully, you know, I, I'm sure all three of us here had that deep intention to really make this thing work, and yeah. uh, that that almost that seriousness of of what we're working with. Uh, whereas there are many people that have no idea, and they're they're not setting that deep intention to go through the actual process. They just want the quick result. So they're trying yeah. to resort to working with a spirit so that the spirit can do it for them. And the next thing you know, what you're explaining starts happening. Yeah. And, you know, my original, a big source of my inspiration for getting just into the spiritual work in general, um, it was actually one of the last uh, videos that XXX Tentacion did before he died. Um, which one for those of you the yeah, one he's like doing the live, the live stream where he's like you know if if, if i you know if, if I, I wind up dead he uh he was he's basically kind of kind of prophesizing his own death in that video mm. and this is like right before he 
that was, that was an interview right before, before he died, before I really started listening to a lot more hip hop. You know what they but, say, uh, yeah. just as a side tangent on, on that whole XXX thing, they say, yeah. and, and he also had the tree of life tattooed on his forehead. Um, he clearly, he was, he was starting to unconsciously move towards initiation as well. I think I, I, I believe towards the clip off. I think that's where he originally is, was going to head, but they say that him and they said that Drake, uh, used psychic warfare on him and in a, oh, sure. like in a significant way, like. And 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 if you pay attention to some of Drake's lyrics and some of his songs, he talks. He will subtly say he uses witchcraft and voodoo and things of that nature. And I have no doubt about it that he does. Um, I've yeah. I've listened to his songs intentionally, and I understand some of the kabbalistic lyrics he has in some of his songs. Right. And um, that yeah. So they say that it was around that time when XXX was actually uh, basically triggered because of Drake, because Drake apparently used one of his flows in a very similar way and 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 it was prominent that he was kind of in a way i guess copying xxx's flow in, in a way and x took that personally said some things publicly about drake how he doesn't respect him he thinks he's a bitch and all that other stuff and then clearly drake is drake seems to be like the kind of guy that's he's he's clearly on the negative polarity and he he's not the kind of guy that holds back his his anger he may not display it publicly, but he's that kind of guy that's going to probably do what we've done in our past where someone crosses a boundary with us, we take it to the psychic realm, and then we exert that right. that expression. And it seems like that may have been what led to that. Yeah. Yeah. Where was I? That? So, yeah. So, I was watching that last interview. AirPod just died. Let me just take these out real quick. Okay. There you go. So... The one thing I really heard him say that kind of this is this is a really big proponent of my this spiritual journey. He, he basically said, you know, if you take anything from this video, write this down, get a piece of paper, get a journal, get a notebook, whatever, just write this down. Three words: create and evolve. Mm. Create and evolve. Mm. And so that basically became my baseline intention very early on before I even got in, before I was even introduced to KRI, before any of that, that was like my baseline intention was to just create, you know, create my life the way I want to live it and evolve, evolve into the person I'm meant to be. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And how did that, so how did that transition you into the darker side of things? Like what, cause there's a big jump from someone who's, doing you know getting into the occult and starting with like the lesser banishing ritual or doing their That's, circle started, of the magician i started, I started right. like uh, yep. after i after i had gotten introduced to karen she did all that stuff and i went to the sophia code and everything and i had find out i had found myself in a slightly more random place i started doing the lbrp for a little bit um i would do like religiously every night for like two weeks straight and eventually i just I felt like I would, you know, I did a ritual with that. I did like a little, like a, a little, uh, I said a little intention to get more hours at the job I was, I was working at. This is like my first real starting to practice like ritual magic. Mm -hmm. And it was like around that time actually where I really started to resonate with, with uh, what people were saying like about the, like I hear people talking about crossing the abyss and that's when I found your channel. So this is around, mid 2021 like early 2021 mid 2021 range mm -hmm. about two years ago crazy it's been that long already <laughs> yeah but, um, yeah so i found your channel you were basically talking about crossing the abyss how to you know how to work through it you know how just be, you know, keep the key was basically being more receptive and then i you know i got up the tarot readings from you had a few calls with you and honestly dude you really helped you really helped me out through that shit like i appreciate you for that <laughs> Yeah, I, I I help a lot of people go through that that stuff because a lot of people do go through these things unconsciously and they have no idea what they're experiencing because right. you know just the nature of of our of our society there's a lot of ritualistic things being promoted to us that can trigger these initiatory experiences and when it comes to the abyss crossing it's like a lot of people literally stay lost in that abyss and they give in to all their unhealthy coping mechanisms and they just stay in that confinement of confusion. Right. Um, right. so yeah, so I, a lot of people have let me know that, you know, my channel was, 
very, very helpful and just me in general for them to navigate that experience. 100%. Mm. And so, you know, fast forward to today now, you know, I have my own personalized practice. I don't really like, I'll basically take excuse me, bits and pieces from different people's practices. Like I'll hit, like I'll, I can watch a whole video about, let's say how someone uses a crystal in ritual and none of it will resonate with me except for like this small 10 second segment. So I take that and I apply it. And I basically, mm. so I'm, I'm basically just like, like just grabbing all these different pieces from everywhere and implementing that and, and just making my own craft out of it. Mm. I love that. I love that. And ultimately that ultimately that's, that's what we're supposed to do. And that's, I actually resonate with that as well. Like there's a lot of people that I have, I've studied from because I'm, I'm very passionate about the occult and it's just something I always want to research and things in that nature. And I've learned from a lot of people, but I've noticed something like I will, I will find people that I resonate with and I will learn. Typically what will happen is that I'll be learning a lot from them. I'll spend a lot of time and energy studying what they're teaching. And then there'll usually come a season where I don't resonate as much with, with what they teach anymore. And then I'll like a new, a new teacher will present. And then yeah. I'll gravitate towards that teacher and I will take what what works for me and then kind of let go of what doesn't. And then sometimes I'll go back to the teacher that was that I had way back then. And it's like yep. these weird cycles of like these spiritual guides that just keep yeah. showing up in my in my journey. Um, what about you, Nick? What's what's some of like do you have any like let's say like spiritual guides that that you yep. kind of found through YouTube that played that significant role? in your spiritual development, like a certain, like almost like a roster of like channels that just kind of showed up during this process? Yeah, 100%. Um, so I've been always the guy that kind of would take, I would, I would be really involved in like having a teacher, whether, the, and it's mainly through like YouTube or something like that. And I would always take whatever that teacher is saying and almost like apply everything and just like okay does this work will this work and typically only what works for me will stay and then obviously the rest will fall away but i kind of just take it and run with it and so kind of what you were saying where you kind of alternate different teachers it's like each teacher possibly speaks to a different aspect of yourself in different mm. times and different like seasons you could say um but yeah i mean i grew up you know when, when i had my spiritual awakening around 15 16 years old that's kind of really when i got into like youtube um teachers i guess you could say and i've been watching people you know talk about anything any and every form of spirituality since mm. then um, and yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of them and I'm, I, it's funny cause I, I've gotten to the point where you were pretty much like the last person that I, I found. And that was maybe th three, three and a half years ago when I first started watching you. Um, mm. so, and, so roughly, roughly similar time as Colin. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. and so it's almost like what you taught, it was like it brought everything together. So it was like there is, I could get this one thing from this one guy, but it was like they're missing a huge part. And then I could mm. get another piece from this guy, but there is still something missing. And so I got to the point where I kind of threw spirituality out completely. And I'm just like, okay, well, this isn't paying the bills. Let's just be normal. Like, and just not even think about it, you know? <laughs> oh and, yeah. Good uh, luck. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. And so that's obviously when I started invoking demons at that point. Cause I was mm. like, I tried everything else, you know, everyone says be afraid of this type of thing, but it's like, maybe there's a reason that there is an actual effort into scaring people from this because mm possibly something that's scary is the most powerful thing that you can actually utilize. And so those are kind of the thoughts I was having. And then from there, I think I just typed in like a demonic, uh, one of the Goetia's names. And then I found your channel and I thought it was kind of interesting because they're 
there's nothing really on YouTube. There's like a few channels that would pop up and everybody else look kind of maybe crazy, I guess you could say. And then like, mm -hmm. you, this was just like a guy wearing a Nike t-shirt, uh, talking, you know, and it was just very interesting because you would think like darker, you know, they'd be wearing like a cape with like a black lipstick or something. And so, yeah, like some scary guy. And so it's like, okay, well, this guy looks pretty normal. Uh -huh. I said, you know, that's what John drew me to Jeremiah Shelley. Like, he just looked like, like you're a regular guy on the street. He's very relatable. Right. Uh, definitely. Yeah. A real, a real occultist. We're hidden. Right. You know? Absolutely. I don't need all the, all the black finger paint and the eyeliner and all that stuff. It's, it's one of the hidden arts of, of the occult is that yeah. it, it's supposed to be hidden, especially when you're, when you're kind of like gravitated towards the darker portions of it. Obviously, we're in a new age where there's technology and I can, you know, find uh, like-minded individuals by sharing that publicly. But in my real world, I'm not walking around telling people I'm a black magician or that I, yeah. you know, invoke darker energies. Right. Um, so. right. And that's kind of the, the point that I got to is where I, I watched all your videos and channels and I've kind of gone down. Really, it's, it's, it's sparked its own journey in, of itself. And then from here, it's like I really don't even feel the need or desire to watch anybody. Like, I feel like I'm just on my own kind of path, um, building my own path, you could say, to share, I guess. Um, mm. But that's the mm. ultimate thing that we can come to at the end of the day is learning that no matter who they are or what person or what they teach or who they associate with, there is some truth to anything that you that you can you know take from something so it's like even if it's religion you know instead of like trying to be like oh you shouldn't be a christian or this or that just listen with open ears because there's probably something that you could learn from this person there's something mm. you can learn from literally anybody so that's why i'm just open i literally i never share my perspective or opinion unless either i feel the need to or i'm asked you know so for all they know i'm just a normal guy you know but there's actually a satanist in the in the church you know talking to them they, they would never know that unless yeah they ask then i might i might may or may not tell them and but. and real and 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 you know, initiated occultists can recognize initiated occultists especially on the left hand path and i can easily tell in you it's there's a there's a similar uh resonance that we we do have where we are more in tune with our feminine energy and that it that does display that quality of recognizing the deeper layers of the universe in in regards to like every moment is a important moment everything is a reflection yes. that's that deep like moon energy so no matter what experience you're having, what communication you're having, there's something coming in that's actually really important to be receptive to. And yes, yeah, so you definitely have those qualities and it's you can tell in someone because I, I don't know if, if you notice it, you know, when you have communications with other people, I notice it in my life. Oftentimes they can make other people uncomfortable because they almost expect an identity in you. Like, who is this person? And when you're in that deep receptive state, it's, it's, it's a close to a, it's a, almost like a formless state and they right. try to like identify you and recognize what they're speaking to. And it's like, they're speaking to the all in a, in a weird way. It's like, they're speaking to a yeah. bunch of so, aspects of the universe through one yeah. person. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a, there's a word for that too. Um, you know, it, this go, this goes like, this is another word for the source, right? It is the no thing no dash thing yeah it is, it is the you know where everything came from or where everything will one day return it is that it, it is it is the void essentially yeah i was literally just thinking that i would like as you were saying that i was look i was thinking about the void on the tree the ain and right. it that's it and and uh once again initiated occultists emanate that energy because as you can see it's at the top of the tree and the void is literally one of the farthest out energies to access. And there was um, a, I, I came up, there was a quote that 
this is this is my, this is my own quote. I haven't heard it from anybody else, but it's basically, you know, as I stared into the void, I recognized that the void was staring back at me, and then it, it was mm. it was then I realized that I was the void all along. Mm. Yeah, it's very true. It's a hundred percent, and that's that's all of us. You know, we're we all. That's the craziest part. Is like we all have our source in that right. primordial void, and part of the weird societal programming is to make us demonize this source of what we actually are, which is like a, a deep but subtle programming to hate the self, yep. mm -hmm. to demonize the self because it's our, it's literally our ancient energetic roots. And the way and, I view it too, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the way I view it too, you know, it's, if you guys have um, ever gone out into the woods and you've really tapped into nature, I've actually had a tree speak to me before and it was very simple. It, was, it, it said, it said, um, it's like four simple words. It's all a game. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, speaking of trees, there's one right down the street that I, I, whenever I go on my walks, I go up to it and I touch it and I'm like, I sit with it and I, I try to communicate with it as well just because this this specific tree looks like the roots like it's one yeah. of these weird trees in florida that like literally looks like its roots are above surface so yeah, every time cool. i connect with it it's like connecting to this part of like the roots of my mind and my yeah. consciousness and yeah you know it's we are living in a in a game in many ways you know this yeah. whole act of life and when we say that we don't mean it, that it's not important this game is a part of our evolution we we actually yeah. are supposed to play it but we're supposed to understand it and be authentic right. with our role in this game, um, right? And not only that, I feel like you know it's all about it's all it's all about the per, per, um, each individual soul's disposition as well, right? It's like you have people that come in and they basically take up space for like the NPCs, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, they're I, I think of those people as like new souls that have basically like they're like there are a lot of newer souls that like you have old, old souls, new souls, and like the more middle souls, right? So mm. like. The new souls are like NPCs. They have no awareness of walking around. I, I think I almost think of it like um, those kind of people. If you want to go into the law of one aspect in the densities, those are people who have just upgraded from the second to the third density. Yep. Yep. And, yep. And then from so they're ba they're basically in survival mode, like straight animal instincts. And then and then there, yep. And then from there you have like the like the more middle soul, like the more middle age kind of souls. Those are the, these are like your scientists. Your teachers, your mm. you know, your your educators, like people who are doing like um, very mechanical, meticulous type of lab work, and then you have the old souls. These are like the philosophers, the you know the revolutionaries, the visionaries. Your Steve Jobs, your Bill Gates, all those kind of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would I would definitely say so. And um, what's your what's your thoughts on that? What's your thoughts on people? being at like, let's say lower stages of consciousness compared to other people being at higher stages. So what are my thoughts on that? Yeah. Like in the sense of like, how do you, how do you perceive that? How does that fit into your, your view on how reality functions and the nature of evolution? So I almost see it as looking into a mirror, right? I, I look out and, and I see people kind of going about their daily lives and it's, it's kind of trippy actually, because I have like this this like like sometimes if like um i'll just like i'm seeing what i experienced oh we lost nick oh. sorry sorry i think we lost nick uh oh all right i'm gonna send him an invite but but keep going I'm, that's interesting what you're saying yeah so i almost see them as a mirror of myself right because i notice a lot of times whenever i encounter like say what you want what i refer to as a new soul or a middle-aged soul mm -hmm. right and people have always told me i'm an old soul so but I, I, I'll see, I'll see people like, like that walking around and it's almost like while simultaneously looking through my own vision, I'm also like remote viewing them and seeing, I like seeing the world through their perspective as well. And I feel how they, I feel that some of the things that they feel, it's, 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 it's a, it's a very trippy kind of feeling. Hmm. Hmm. I, I don't even try, I don't even try to do it either. It just, it just happens. So you're like, in many ways, you're able to tune into their their experience through your own yeah, experience right and it, it's and have an understanding right and it, it's it's like i see what i i see my own you know through this 
vessel but there's like mm -hmm. almost like an overlay like you have like a like a head like a pair of some glasses on where you're also seeing theirs overlay through your own it's it's weird <laughs> it's weird man. Mm. Mm. yeah and i think that in many ways that can you know well i like to kind of dispel the idea that you know we need to awaken the world you know everyone needs to to be aware conscious and all those things because uh everyone's at their stage and yeah. this whole stage of you know stages of 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 evolution they all pin off each other so for example the souls that are more experienced and have been doing this for a longer time we use the awareness of the newer souls the ones that are kind of stuck in those you know matrix mentalities and and cycling through through traumas we can use that as references to better know ourselves just like they can use us as references as you know causing a change in their life direction um so a lot of people think we need to wake everyone up that's the whole goal we got to get everyone to become aware and it's like people are where they're at for a reason and yeah. you you never want to force uh these processes right. uh because you're going to waste a lot of time and energy trying to do that and it's just being being present with you know, where things are and understanding that they are where they are for a reason can be one of the most liberating states to to be in. Because what I find is a lot of people specifically when it comes to the right hand path or the love and light community, a lot of them have a worldview that is based on that dualistic thinking of evil kind of being the back burner that's fueling their, I am good. This is what I need to do. This is my purpose. And I find that a lot of that lacks the true awareness that everything is playing off of that yin yang dynamic, that positive negative interaction. Uh, do you guys have any perspectives on that alone? Yeah. So, um, I had something. Uh, oh yeah. So on the notion of, you know, people wanting to wake up the whole world, I used to be one of those people, right? That's, that's, that's what, that's literally what Landon be in like, psycho like states of psychosis. I'm like, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. There's all this going on. Oh my God. Like I had like this, this this explosion of awareness, and I wanted to help people see what I saw because I, I was you know, I was excited. I was you know like and I'm like, what if everyone could see this? How much better would, could the world be? And that led to me yeah. basically that, that basically led to me sacrificing my own good, sending myself to the you know, the um mental hospital in Florida. It's called the Baker Act. I had that happen on multiple occasions, mm -hmm. and. You know, sometimes from that, sometimes that, other times when I was actually starting to initiate through the clip off, and I, and I was still figuring out, figuring out how to process that. But anyway, what, what am I getting out of here? So when it comes to, you know, anyone out there who may have feel feel this want to really go and wake up the world, well, you still do that on a more, on a more subtle level. Just never, how I feel like this, never underestimate, never underestimate the power of planting a seed. Yeah. 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 And, and plant a seed, not trying to control how it grows. Right. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. if something comes up a conversation, you plant a little seed, say you say something and then it rubs them the wrong way. They get scared and they go the other way. Well, that's, that's not in their, in their subconscious to ger to germinate and, and grow. And it may not, it may not even sprout in this lifetime. It may take multiple reincarnations for that seed to even start to take root and sprout. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and don't don't waste your time and energy on something either that's not in resonance with who you are either. Exactly. You know, if you're if you are one of those beings that has true knowledge and, and experience to initiate a soul, don't waste your time and energy on a soul that's not willing to to honor your experience. Right. Or, because or there are that. many souls and spirits that are out there that will honor your experience and they will come right. to you. But you you would only be cutting yourself short trying to trying to control this person's or this being's evolution right like um, i met this i met this dude earlier today i haven't even slept yet it's been over the past four, 24 hours i'm surprised i'm still functioning properly um I met geez that, what's that i said geez yeah <laughs> spiritual energy tends to keep me up sometimes I'm trying to ground it all in but anyway i met this dude at the gas station i was just walking um and you know, went to get myself some breakfast, just a banana, some yolk, some little yogurt drink, energy shot, all that. Keep myself awake. And I met this one dude there. And he was like really educated on like different symbolism. Um, just like how dating back to like the history, like 
throughout um, history back millennia. And uh, honestly, like, I, I think I think you should get him on the show, Jeremiah. He he, like, he is really like knowledgeable about just symbolism and how it traces back throughout history and how symbols used in the past have come up to today, how they've been modernized. And it's he, he's wow. He, he, he blew my mind in multiple ways today. I was like, wow. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, I'd be I'd be down for that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, if you want to, if you want to connect me with him, I would totally have yeah, him on. Sure. If you want to yeah, plug him in to, to to my contact, we could definitely yeah. get him on here. Yeah, I, I put him, I put him onto your YouTube channel already, so he he'll be watching this interview probably the next, whenever you upload it. Cool. So if he's listening to this now, we want you on the podcast. So come on. Yep. Come on. Um, okay. Come on down. Cool. So let's let's uh let's see let's let's shift directions a little bit let's let's talk about some of the darker aspects of spirituality because i yes. think there needs to be more more awareness on these aspects and oh, especially nice. with what i teach and what i do there's a, a large portion of what i do that is connected to black magic and, and this yeah. part of things the right um to that i want to draw a card yeah. just the collective energy of what we're about to dive into how, how well, what kind of directions is going to take us in i'm going to follow it too with an oracle <laughs> let's see and just to touch before we move to the next topic um i was just talking to somebody about how mainstream christian or i'm sorry mainstream spirituality is just like a neat nicely decorated christianity so it's like mm, yeah people have just kind of taken this this religion of christianity and like stuck it on spirituality so it's like you're still practicing the exact same things and, and and you're still having that good versus evil war, you know. And so a lot of people I've noticed that have a spiritual awakening become very chaotic in nature because they're always at war with this evil negative energy. And they're always having to put protections up and saging the environment. and And it's like, you know life was good before you had you know awakened to all of these ideas you know you were right. good before that and so that's kind of what i learned was that sometimes when we have a spiritual awakening we actually can go farther into our own hell and we can actually have create more pain and more suffering from ideas that we take on and belief systems of this good and evil and yeah. so the most liberating thing that i found within the occult field is that nothing is good or evil that everything has something to teach us and it's yeah. just our duty to take um each energy and transmute them into your own personal power and so nothing is mm -hmm. good or bad at the end of the day i but, love that i love that and that's yeah, actually that's that. yeah, yeah i want to add, add on to that too so while there is no thing as good and evil still existing within this duality we are still going to have like see things out there in the world that we may not necessarily agree with when it comes to our values right and so it's our personal responsibility to basically you know do what we need to do in order to you know change these things that we want that we, that we want to change in the world it's like gandhi said be the change you want to see in the world yeah every that's another good point every single person has their own individual soul with its own polarization with its own likes and its dislikes even though the higher truth is all things are connected you know all things need to be understood in that way it's like we still have our own our own perspectives our own mindset that resonate with our unique polarization and it is important that we do honor that and make sure that we don't fall into that that trap of like oh i need to i need to like everything i need this is like and this is almost a little bit of the new wave that's kind of moving into the mass collective which i think has its benefits to it where it's like okay we're seeing how all things need to be loved and accepted but it also does lead a lot of people into thinking i need to like everything that i'm not supposed to like and no that's not the case so yeah so that's really cool uh what nick what you just said nick that brings up actually a great next topic of the personal hell that we all have inside of us mm -hmm. and the reality that in order for us to make significant change in our life, we have to actually face that hell and get to know yep. our own personal hell. 
in the occult field, we call this the clip off. And we actually initiate consciously to the deepest degrees of this hell space, which is not for everyone, but everyone to some degree has to work with their own hell, whether they're aware of it or not. And what I've come to find is that a lot of people refer to this part of their, their consciousness, the deep portions of the unconscious, largely connected to trauma, whether it's in this lifetime or generational trauma. A lot of people refer to hell and demons as literally the negative energies that are stored in their DNA or in their nervous systems because of this trauma. So they, what they do is they actually demonize the energy that generated from the trauma. So they're literally demonizing this part of themselves that feels sad, depressed, angry, um, lonely, um, afraid. And in reality, it's like that's the younger you that went through trauma most likely and yeah. you went through something that was tough and that made you sad, made you afraid, made you um, lonely or depressed. And it's just that younger side of you that needs to re-experience and feel that emotion yeah. consciously in order to process it, integrate it, and then transmute it into potential and power and authenticity. But most people do not access that inner child that we all have inside of us um, because there is so much uh, indoctrination, so much programming to make us think that is not appropriate. That is not, that's not how I'm going to survive, that this is not going to protect me. This is actually evil. You know, literally people will, will avoid that part because they actually think it's evil inside of them. Yep. And that is a, that is the worst hell that you can live in. You literally cannot fully love your whole being because you think a part of you, a, a major part of you, literally a root part of you is actually evil. Can you imagine that? So what comes up as we're talking about this subject? So when you had mentioned um, generational trauma, right? Something else we went to account to is past life trauma. So our past lives may not necessarily always be linked with our bloodline. It can I, I feel it can jump different bloodlines depending on what the soul is trying to accomplish. It's, uh, you know, um, someone I know came up with this term and, you know, I have, I have to give credit where it's due Adam a Percipio. He, he coined, he coined this term. It's called the alchemical Arturum. It's mm. basically like I had to grok it on my own. Um, it's basically the formula for your soul's evolution to its highest potential achieving the greatest heights it can possibly achieve. Mm. So getting, so how that ties into past lives, it's like, I've done some past life regression work myself and I've actually been assassinated in past lives. And mm. so having to deal with that on a conscious level today, where it's like, I've had this, I've, I've been having to work through this a lot. It's been really difficult because like, if you guys have ever, have, you, have either of you guys ever done a past life regression? Yep. Yep. So I had a, mm -hmm. so I went out and just some, it can only be described as some of the most heinous ways possible. You know, it's like the medieval torture racks type of stuff, you know, I work, I work with a guy in one of my mentorships and he, he has a very vivid past life memory of his head getting chopped off. And it clearly like, it it still unconsciously runs through him in this lifetime. Right. Um, like the the most uh in the, the most prevalent one that for me is getting shot by a sniper type of type of thing. Mm. Cause like I guess I was some I was a big political figure and pop pop. Hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've got a past life where like the only past because like through my my initiatory journey, actually some of these things surfaced out of nowhere. Yeah. And uh two memories of like past lives that I have had become very clear to me. And one of them was actually during the dark ages, the medieval ages. And I was actually a king at that time. And um, that was pretty much as far back as my memory took me. It just, I saw myself as a king. I, I had a darker energy to me in the sense that I was working with psychics. I was working with Kabbalah. Um, and that's about it. Um, then I had a memory surface of me actually being a reptilian. And this is like 
this month, I don't know, I don't think this is on planet Earth, but I, I have a clear memory of me surfacing as this reptilian with other reptilians. And we're kind of like in this ritualistic space and we're literally doing uh, magic. We're, we're doing something on some sort of planetary sphere, establishing control of this planet or something of that nature. That's as far back as they go. This I, these memories surfaced back in 2021 for the first time during my initiation, or excuse me, not to that, 2019 is when they surfaced, when I first started initiating. Just recently, there's a metaphysical place that's close by to where I live now. I intuitively felt led to go there and get this reading from a random psychic. And I, I go in, I, I, I sit down with this lady and she's like pulling cards and she wants to kind of like, shift into like my past life. And this was like intuitive because I was telling her about what I was going through and how I was working, you know, trying to heal some certain traumas with my father. And she just wanted to take it to the past lives just to see. And she started doing some stuff. I didn't tell her anything about my experiences with these visions that I just discussed. And she, the first thing she says was she's like, I see you in the dark ages. And I'm like, that's wild that you're picking up on this because that's literally where my, my memories have take, taken me. And then she's like, I specifically see you with your father and you guys are like this, like you guys are hand in hand together, like father, son dynamic, uh, rulers of, of a kingdom in a, in a way. I don't know. I don't know if I was the father at that time and he was the son or what, what's going on. But, um, she, yeah, she said, she said in this vision, you, you had these like cloaks on and you guys were performing some sort of like, uh, some sort of magic together, like in a, in a temple. And I thought that that was just like very fascinating that this lady that I've never met before picked up on some sort of a phenomena in my unconscious that I never expressed to her. And that confirmed a lot of what I went into and even took it to a deeper degree. Um, so yeah, I thought I would mention that. That's that's interesting. But actually, a phrase uh, what you're referring to that unconscious part. So that so the psychologist, the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, he actually refers to it as the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. that basically, yeah. everything, everything that's ever happened within the collective of humanity is sitting there, is waiting to be waiting, waiting to be transmuted. You know, and even on that subject, I think that's that's interesting because the concept of the abyss seems to be in my experience not just the mass collective unconscious but the unconscious of other planets as well yeah. it's like all combined into yeah. this one location energetically yeah. called the abyss mm, definitely is so i wanted to pull up that card real quick that i drew so yeah pull that out and then i got mine too yep. so we have crucible purifying so that's Funny I drew this, right? Because you have the element of fire down here at the bottom. And then going up to the top, you have almost, it's like a, you know, it's the crucible. It's where you, it's, it's that, it, what's coming to mind for me right now is trial by fire. Purifying the aspects of ourselves that no longer serve. Being able to dive deep within the unconscious and uproot the most deep-rooted things that are essentially holding us back. Whether it is thought patterns, beliefs, traumas, etc., so that we can ultimately become more pure within our own soul. Mm, I love that. That's 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 literally kind of like everything we're talking about too is just kind of purifying a lot of a lot of belief systems and, and perspectives and yeah, that's that's really cool. This is what I pulled to follow that. Oh, look at that. I didn't even read it yet. Look at that. I didn't even read it yet. That's my first time seeing it. The message says you are wow. currently healing past life wounds. Wow. I, I, and I Look drew, at that. I drew, I drew two more cards too. So we have tower dismantling. This is pretty self-explanatory. It's just, it's, it's being able to go, you know, basically picking those things apart. It's as you, as you're purifying, you're also dismantling and picking those things apart and analyzing them. So you can understand them on a deeper level and not only on analyzing them, but feeling them too. So really, I love those, that. Take, oh, dropped it. Taking those things apart and then moving forward with that, you move. We move in, into the adept card, the advancing card. Mm. So this is a more. This is a very heal state. It's a very balanced state. On top here, we have the element of fire once again with a dot in the center. 
that dot basically representing our soul, our true will, as Crowley once put it. And then you have the, the circle around here with the X in the center. If you look at the Kabbalistic tree at Mount, at Mount Kuth, that you, that you have that there as well, that little X. Right there. You have that X yeah. there, and you have that, you have that right here. So it's grounding. It's it's ultimately gra helping ground all that energy into Malkuth and manifesting that adept energy in this life, so you can move forward with more efficiency, precision, and strategy in your life. Yeah, I get big like full archetype vibes from that, like the the beginning of the initiation kind of energy. Right. Very cool. Very cool. And we're always so going yeah to initiation, which is beautiful. It is. It is. That's, I think that's another thing about, about life that a lot of people don't fully understand is that every moment is a, is a, is a, um, it's, it's, it is actually in its highest level. It's, it's a structured process of growth, yeah. um, to our logical mind. We're not supposed to fully understand every nook and cranny of this, but this, on the, this right now, even like this, this podcast that we're shooting, you know, we've gone off on all these different tangents, right? But we, but at the at the end of the day, we all piece it back together, and that ultimately helps everyone else who's going to be viewing this. You know, they're going to be able to scroll through different parts of this podcast that maybe they don't resonate with this part, but they resonate with this part with this subject we're talking about. I, but I think that's a really beautiful thing. That's like logically, like logically, our minds are like, we need to stay on this topic, but then our souls are like, we're going this way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the beauty of it. And, and and just this whole thing that we just went through with the card poles and yeah. obviously those are symbols on the cards and the stuff we're talking about. This is very initiatory in its nature. Just yeah. like all the stuff we take in with music videos, entertainment, yeah. this Even is stronger. initiatory. Yeah, like this is going to cause someone's journey to start unfolding. I mean, what are the odds we just pulled those cards? That was not right. just for us. I think right. we've... We, we constantly go through this death and rebirth process, but there's someone that's going to watch this podcast and that is going to act as a massive initiation for them. Right. So that's really cool. Um, so I know we wanted to brush up on dark, on working with dark, uh, what was it, darker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually had an experience about a year and a half ago where I found myself summoning Baphomet in a dream. Hmm. Before Very I... Interesting. Before I had ever invoked any entity, worked with any de deity or anything at all, found myself invoking Baphomet in a dream, and he showed up, and he basically looked at me, and he's like, "You're ready." Mm. Mm. And then, so then, when did that happen? This was 2021, I think. I think this is like shortly after I encountered your channel. Mm. Before I so then. The or any of that so then what how did you interpret that and how did you what did you go about after having that that pretty significant vivid dream so i kind of brushed it off at first because i didn't know what to make of it like i knew it was baphomet but i'm like you know i, I didn't know where to start because i'd never worked with any spirits before so i kind of just put it on the shelf for a little bit and then eventually i heard you talking about one of your videos about invocation how it was on your patreon how you try to do it i'm like okay we're gonna look a little bit more into that Mm. And so I went straight to the big man. I went straight to Lucifer <laughs> during my first invocation and, you know, worked with him a little bit, made a con we made a contract. And then I moved on to Beelzebub. We also made a contract. And then I started working with Baphomet at, um, at that point, worked with him for a few weeks. And he's very all about balance. You know, he, he, yeah. He, yeah, yeah, that you know, the, 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 finger, the finger up and the finger down. Yeah, the masculine and the feminine. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. And also representing as above, so below. Mm -hmm. And then on top of his head, yeah, you have the torch of illumination. Yeah, yeah, and this is just on that subject, like, you know, obviously, whether we're male or female, us having a gender is the manifestation of duality inside of a matrix. But yep. energetically, we all have this masculine and this feminine energy inside of us. And bringing these energies into a union is one of the most important things that we do yep. to literally reach authentic self. 
authentic being and power. It's like bringing the positive and the negative charge to like closely together so it can just create this explosion of power. And what I find is that we have, most of us have parts of ourself that are connected to this masculine and this feminine energy, almost in a fragmented way, connected to our parents. So like a lot of us have a, a feminine inner child part that is in many ways represented by our mother's consciousness. And then a lot of us have a masculine oriented part that is a little bit more controlling, protective, providing that is related to our fathers. And if we have discord in the in the family or if we have trauma in those regards sometimes that can cause us as the the being that has inside of us to not be able to unify these two fragments of our consciousness between the mother and the father or the masculine and the feminine and that is naturally going to create that discord which once again kind of does lead back into what i was saying earlier about how most of us identify with our with our identities, the masculine protector, because that's the energy we typically will associate as keeping us safe, even though most of us do this out of balance and we don't embrace our feminine energy, which is the doorway to the to the inner child and is accessible through the mother. So um I I know that working with an energy like Lucifer or Baphomet, all of these entities. Um, especially when it comes to these negatively polarized entities that have this primordial, you know, sacred knowledge that that can really tap you into like deep processes of growth. This Baphomet energy is is really designed to help us create this alchemical union. And to establish that, there's a lot of in-between that needs to be worked on. Like I think a lot of people don't fully understand what it means to actually create harmony between the masculine and the feminine energy within the self. Um, right. Literally, you could think of it like the di the true dynamic of the masculine and the feminine is literally the, they have roles. They have polarized roles. The masculine is a protector, is in many ways a provider, and is in many ways the lead. It's 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 what leads and and defends. Whereas the feminine is the nurturer. It's the feeler. It's the 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 pres the purity of the present. And having your own masculine energy protect your feminine energy to give you safety to express your feminine energy when you need to, that's a union. That's a harmony. That's both of these parts working together. Uh, once again, most of us in our own psyches are dealing with a divorced, toxic relationship where the masculine has divorced the feminine and they, are, they hate each other. They, they have kids together. They created more fragments and they really hate each other and they don't even call each other. Now the kids are getting traumatized and there's more fragmentation in consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's just an analogy, but it's, yeah. So I thought that whole Baphomet, you bringing up Baphomet kind of connects to that alchemical union inside of the self. hundred percent. And if we want to touch it a little bit further, deeper on the alchemical union, right? When it comes to, and, you know, think about your internal body chemistry. Right. What are you like? What are the what are the things that we're eating? What are we drinking? What are we putting into our body? Are we drinking more alkaline water or are we drinking more acidic stuff like juices and you know sodas? And don't be wrong. There's nothing wrong with juice, but you know, are, are, it's all about moderation, of course, with everything. But are you, like, what are you eating? Are you making? Are you eating healthy foods? You know, are you cook? Are you eating home cooked meals? Are you like you know grilled chicken and veggies and all that? Or are you going to McDonald's and eating? What is basically poison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another that's another great topic. Um, uh, and I actually came from the field of fitness and understanding like, like exercise and nutrition and things of that nature. I went to school for that and I've just been experienced with it in my life in general, having been that person that's like really strict, like on certain regimens, I've, I've gone through cycles like this in my life. And what I've come to find is that, you know, everything needs to be in balance and balance looks different for every single person. 100%. And I'll give you an example. Like, do we we know generally, like as a mass collective, generally what healthy foods are, whole foods. These are generally going to be what you yeah. want to gravitate towards, whether that's meats, you know, fresh meats, vegetables, and fruits. 
Um, and then we generally, as a mass collective, know unprocessed foods, cookies, you know, snack bars, chips. These are going to be the things that typically will 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 resonate is probably not the best for us. But this is where it gets nuanced, and this is why there needs to be balance in all things. You know, we may follow a regimen that is healthy for us. It could be literally the perfect way of of nourishing our body, our body, but we have souls and spirits that live inside these bodies as well. And the soul and the spirit also plays a massive role in nourishing the physical functions of the body. Yes. So in the past, let's say, for example, we grew up in a family dynamic where we had a loving connection with, let's say, a mother figure. And we remember having cookies at night with mom and she made the the cookies. And that gives us that sense of like connection, that that love from the mother. Well, as we're older, that experience can connect us back to that mother love. And to keep balance in the equation, it's not that we have cookies every night trying to connect to that mother's love, but if there's that, that, that feeling every, you know, once in a while where it's like, you know what, I'm going to treat myself and I'm going to connect to this memory and this love that I received from this divine feminine that I've, I have in my life by having cookies and enjoying them and, and savoring them. That is very nourishing for the soul, even though those foods aren't technically the best for the body. It would actually offer value. So that's why it's these things are very dynamic and you don't ever want to be too rigid because what you see in the modern health field currently, everyone's rigid and everyone's trying to find the thing. It's keto, it's carnivore, it's veganism, it's paleo, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. And in reality, Everything plays a role. Every single food has a, a, a piece of consciousness within it. And yep. to, to be stuck to one thing shows you are sac- or you are suppressing a part of yourself and you are favoring other parts of yourself over a, a, a certain part of yourself. And the way it's physically manifesting is saying, these are the only good foods. This is all I'm going to eat. Whereas the person who has internal harmony with their full consciousness, meaning they're working on the different fragmentations, bringing them into unification. This person is going to approach life from a general space of, I generally stay with whole foods that nourish my body, but I will also experience what feels right for my soul. And I'm not going to be yeah. afraid of it. I'm not rigid yeah. to it. Yeah. I, f- I feel that hundred percent. Cause like I was eating you know, grilled chicken and salad for lunch every single day for uh, my job for a while. And then one day I'm like, you know, I really want a Big Mac, <laughs> so yeah, I'm just sort of really craving it. So I, I, you know, I let myself go and enjoy that, and that really brought me, it just brought me back to this growing you know, times, growing up. You know, I get getting out of high school, going to get a fat greasy burger at the nearest burger joint. Yeah, was, and it was, connects was, you right back to that memory. Right, right, and 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 as it connects you back to that memory, it helps you process some of those those emotions that are connected to the memory, which brings you back to the past and further helps you integrate. And the more we integrate, that's what translates to physical health. Um, uh, so a, a, funny, a, funny, a funny memory I want to share. I, I find this I find, I find it's hysterical. I have this friend still. He, uh, the, I, I, find myself, I found myself craving a bunch of regular McDonald's cheeseburgers, right? Okay. And this, this brought me back to a time where he had me go to McDonald's for him and grab him 20 cheeseburgers <laughs> to bring to him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a lot of cheeseburgers. I remember the last time I did that, I was high as hell <laughs> <laughs> way back in the day. Right. Oh no. <laughs> That's so funny. You would just That's see him in a French class reaching into his bag, pulling out a cheeseburger. And I'm like, seriously? He's like, yeah. <laughs> just eats it in the middle of the class. That's funny. <laughs> Uh, so let's go into, let's, let's touch on something else. And then I guess we're yeah. coming up to the two hour mark. So we'll probably yeah. wrap it up around that, that mark too. Yeah. Um, we, we've, we've covered a lot so far, yeah. you know, we, we, we got a lot of good stuff in here, but I, I want to ask Nick something. So I want to hear what's your perspective on demons. What do you view when it, like, what do you view is the role of a demon and what exactly is it? Yeah, so 
I guess the basic um, idea of a demon, which primarily most people have, is it's this it's this evil creature that haunts homes or possesses people and they're evil and you don't want anything to do with a demon and when getting into the occult field there's a difference so there's parasitic entities and then there's demons or daemons mm -hmm. and there's a selection of daemons called the 72 goetia and those would be considered demons but after working with them very extensively, almost every single one of them, you come to learn that they're not, they're not what you think they are. They're, they're not, they can manifest as like a, a scary looking thing, but they almost manifest as a, like a reflection of your perspective. Yes. So for example, just me working with them i i've come to find that they're just like friends they're just like people like you and me and they and they they take shape and they take form however they need to and it it changes on your perspective so if you think something's evil something will be evil and it will come in the form of this big scary face or, or whatever that is um, um, but if you think that this thing actually has value to offer then it will have value to offer and so mm. basically what the the daemons are or the goetia is they're like beings that make up this like negative polarity you could say and i believe that they specifically make up a certain portion of our universe so we have demons and then we have angels mm. and they both kind of almost make up the fabric of the universe that we live in at least and so who we are as a human we're made we're like in the womb of creation so we're almost like inside of another entity's inside of their womb or inside of this person or being or, adding or a huge that. amount do what kind of, kind of adding on to that um i personally view demons as either they're, they're, they're earthbound entities primarily yes they exist throughout the collective um in the cosmos however they're primary primarily uh, earthbound because that's where that's basically kind of where if you look if you look at the electric keys of solomon right he basically took all these different deities and beings and entities from different cultures around the world and basically consolidated them into a single book and gave them like some like uh, slightly similar change names or whatever but basically stripping away a lot of their attributes which is why whenever you work with a certain go ahead spirit say uh for example um i'll say one i've been working with iman uh iman is really good for helping get your life together in all sorts of beautiful ways it doesn't really say that at all in the lesser keys of solomon right so there's all these hidden attributes as well to these spirits that are ultimately beneficial to you know getting your life in order. It's like, it's like you said next like it's like like the friends you know they want to they want to help you out they want to help you grow and evolve however it's, if it's like you're getting into this for the wrong reasons say you go at, let's say you first time you're ever doing this first time you're ever getting involved and your intention is to like really hurt somebody that didn't deserve it well they're gonna do something that, tur that basically turns you away from that because you're not coming in with the you're not coming in with the proper intention and that's how you get a lot of demonization to this day as well. Right. And so the cool, the cool thing that I like about demons is that you can call upon an angel, whether that's for manifestation or, you know, just for guidance. Right. And if you come at an angel with the wrong intention, then they may just, they might just leave and you, you may never see them again. You know, they're like, okay, well, they need to grow some more. The thing about demons is that you actually want to, be sure and be ready before you call upon the spirit because when you call upon it it's almost like you you ha have opened the doorways to this aspect of yourself so yeah. if you call upon it for the wrong reasons regardless you've called upon it and now it's in your life 
And so if you're not developing yourself, this demon will kind of play off of you. It will kind of like be in your life and almost cause triggers and like kind of like act as the adversary within your life. Yeah. And that's the, that's the major role that they play. And that's why I love them so much is because they're actively showing you where you can improve and what parts of yourself you need to transform. And until you transform mm-hmm. that, then it's like it, you can see them as a powerful mentor. And then you can begin working with them, gaining their, their knowledge, gaining their power. And yeah. So I love that. Let me chime in on that. That's that's amazing breakdown too. Um, yeah. So it's like the way that I view it is that these demons seem to definitely be a part of the negative polarity. And I, I think that is the kind of like the perspective that we're observing between demons and angels. It's like the positive and the negative charge. And um, I believe that demons have a nature of serving themselves as the source, whether that's manifesting in human form where it's like, it's like, you know, the way that we work, it's like, I'm building an empire. I, I want to increase my power. And I'm gonna do what I can to be the, you know, the the most powerful version of myself for myself. I also care about other people. Obviously, I love other people. I help a lot of people, but the polarization of my growth is towards myself, right. and that would be the difference between the negative polarity. That's why I, I don't do things just for the good sake of it necessarily. I, I require right. things in return. Um, and on the human form, that, that would be the manifestation of a demon or someone embracing demonic energy. Whereas in the higher planes, it could be an entire collective consciousness of what we would consider aliens, the social memory complex, an entire civilization of entity that is sharing similar intention, similar mindset, and is negatively polarized that has a goal to influence lower planetary spheres, specifically the ones that are in the decision-making process, like the third density, like planet Earth, where we have humans that are in between, humans that are positively polarized, humans that are negatively polarized. What What I've come to find is that there are hierarchies to the negative polarity. So Earth being third density, let's say we move up into the fourth density. I believe fourth density negative entities, which we would, we could consider demons, are going to be entities that maybe aren't willing as much to necessarily show you the rights and the wrongs of how to use this dark energy. Maybe they're a little bit more concerned with with power and giving you power to polarize so that they can polarize without, without actually giving you the exact knowledge on, hey, if you do this, this is gonna be your consequence. Whereas higher up in the polarity, I think what we're working with entities like the rulers of the clip off, Lilith, Scarlet Woman, Lucifer, Hecate, Belial, these are going to be the entities that actually have been involved with the negative evolution for a long time. So they understand more of the cosmic laws and the necessity to guide the individuals working with that darker energy to know how to use it in tandem with cosmic law. So I believe there's a lot of people that work with demonic energies that do kind of fall down that path of like getting certain knowledge from these forces, using the knowledge from a space of being basically uh, running away from things buried in their unconscious. That knowledge turns into a weapon against themselves. And a lot of those negative entities, they'll let that happen. They'll say, go ahead, take this knowledge. Some, Some might even encourage you to use it in that way. Just because the nature of the negative polarity is like, I'm here to give you tools for your power. And I'm also here to be an adversary. Like if you're going to fall into this trap that I'm going to lead you into by giving you this power that you don't know how to use, some of them do that. And that's just a part of this path. And that's why you have to, that's why focusing on the emotional processing doing the 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 going back to you know traumas and things in that nature feeling the emotions all that stuff that's why that becomes so important because you check in with yourself and you make sure am i using this appropriately and when you're working with lucifer these higher up demons they tend to have a much more 
investment in you as the initiate to make sure you're using these energies properly. That's what I've come to I've come to find. Do you guys resonate with that? Yeah, definitely. Hmm. Hmm. So yeah, so with that being said, I mean, I think we're coming up to that final that final space of this this podcast. Did you guys have any any last thoughts that you wanted to share? Yeah. So I wanted to touch on this. So this is kind of going back briefly to when we were talking about the the um, good versus evil, right? I just wanted okay. to add this, I just wanted that as final final idea in there, right? Yeah. It's the illusion of strife. Everything is really just in all one giant intricate dance between the light and the dark. Light yes. is essentially ecstatic intercourse between creation and destruction. And even as you said that, that and that's beautiful, that that just sparked up this last piece that I wanted to add to kind of what I was just saying just previously about demons. The reason why I say that is because when we look at real time now, we clearly see there is demonic influence that's being used in a sinister way, like a very, very sinister way. And guess what? It's not evil. It's the negative polarity. It plays its role within the matrix that we live in. And there is a strong relationship to pe- to demonic energies connected to our matrix within this planetary sphere, as well as other third density planetary spheres that have one as well. Um, because we need a matrix in this type of uh, ex- in this type of evolutionary experience. And who is going to be the beings that govern the matrix? It's going to be the negative polarity because the matrix is designed under Saturnian influence, uh, restriction, isolation, confinement, separation. And it's through these these energies where we get to experience love unity, wholeness, and the exact opposite of what they are. So, um, you know, just having that real realistic look of what's actually going on on our planet, like there's clearly a uh, ritualistic influence being done by people on the negative polarity that's designed to harm you. That doesn't mean karma doesn't still exist. I do believe those people are going to pay the price. Eventually it comes full circle, but um, that will be that will be something they have to experience. And that still doesn't mean that what they're doing isn't supposed to happen. So this, right. there is always this dance that is taking place. Even when we see these things that can seem so corrupt, it's like, how is that even good? How, or how is that even possible? How could, how could this be something that you write off as, as, as something that's supposed to happen? And the answer to that question is that you haven't died yet in this lifetime. You don't know what happens after death. That's the answer. It always is going to be the answer to that type of question. You have no idea what happens outside of this existence. And until you go there, that's when you start to really understand it is literally a dance between the positive and the negative, creating the yin to the yang and that balance. The fluid type rope walking dance. Yep. Yep. What about you, Nick? Did you have any like final thoughts on on anything? Yeah, and I was going to say, so if evil doesn't exist, then we have nothing to point the finger at. We have nothing to blame for all our problems. So just that thought, it can trigger a lot of people when you say it doesn't exist. Yes, there is Mm. terrible things that happen in the world, but what does that thought do to you it take it threatens what possibly you're holding on to as this thing that's causing your suffering or your pain and without it it's we have nothing to point the finger at we have no one to blame nothing to blame but ourselves at that point yeah mm, that's deep that's really deep and and it totally does it dismantles your security net a lot of the time a lot of the times um and that's a healthy dismantling. It's me- it's meant for a good intention. Um, it's just scary for a lot of people that have been stuck with this reality, right? With this 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 personality, this identification of themselves that comes with all these external beliefs that holds the identity in place, and then uh, 
like what you're saying, when we remove those security nets of like, you know, the government's the reason, my wife's the reason, my my husband's the reason, my kids, they did it. Like when you remove all that, you're left with, oh my God, this identity is not real. This personality I've created is not real. And that's one of the scariest things for people to do to then transition into the unknown and become who they really are. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, with that being said, I think we covered everything we needed to cover in this podcast. Yeah. I appreciate both of you guys for, for hopping on here. And a final card to close it out. Ah, master. master. Yeah. Let's do it. What does the bottom say? Contemplating? Completing. Oh, completing. As we come to a close. <laughs> wow. And you just intuitively pulled that? Yep. So message from this card is essentially take all the information that we've talked about here. Don't take anything on his dog at face value. Contemplate it for yourself and come to your own conclusions. That is how you master your own psyche. That is how you master your own reality. That is how you keep, that is how you prevent yourself from falling to dogma. Mm, let it be said. But you, you, let, you, you, you said contem- contemplation. So yeah, contemplate is, you know, contemplation is key for that. Literally. And I noticed, I noticed you said that and I was like, oh, interesting. I love that. I love that. All right, guys. Well, thank you once again for coming in and um, thank you to everyone who's watching. Definitely make sure you subscribe to the uh, to the YouTube channel. Uh, definitely make sure you check out Nick on YouTube. Nick's got his own YouTube channel right now. Nick, do you want to want to give a shout out? Yeah, definitely. Um, check out the Cosmic Observer at um, on YouTube. Um, I do similar content as uh, Jeremiah does. And also, Colin, you just launched your podcast. Yes. If you're like really just, ah. <laughs> just launched it last week on my birthday. So sweet, that, give it a shout out. Yeah, so it's going to be the whole launch show, and I'm going to be diving into a wide variety of subjects, um, not only occult but also more nuanced, like things like nutrition, um, just different vitamins and supplements that people can use. I'll be talking about zero point energy. A few conspiracy theories here and there, stuff that's actually like has some sort of ground to it because you have a lot of wild out out there stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, enlightenment, strategy, illumination, different books I read, anime. It's going to be a variety show. I'll be breaking out as far as so I'll be I'll be breaking out symbolism and and a whole lot of stuff too. I love it. I love it. That's super cool. That's super cool. Definitely. We're just getting started right now. I'm going to have to get you know, better technology down the line, better hardware, better software, so I can start doing some uh, more uh, creative stuff. But as of right now, it's just like a blog or a, a vlog style channel. But it will evolve as time goes on. So stay tuned. Yes. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. Well, you've got you've got a lot of plans in front of you. Um, okay. s- super cool. Super cool. And, and for anyone also who's here watching now, um, if any of you are have like an interesting story and are into the occult and you're you're taking it a little bit more seriously and you want to come on a podcast like this um and you want to just discuss some of your experience with the occult what you've been through um and just have these types of discussions that we just did now leave it in the comment section if this is something you're interested in uh, me and nick can invite you on the podcast and if you leave your name in the comment section, I can uh, send you my email and you can send me a message there and then we'll get in contact there. But yeah, that's kind of like the goal of this podcast. And eventually this is going to be put on a separate YouTube channel specifically for the podcast, which is going to be called The Black Diamond. And that'll be the name of the podcast. And the goal Love is it. to kind of just, isn't it going to be, it's going to be a cool name. The goal is to get individuals like Colin uh, like me, like Nick, people that are generally into this kind of stuff that have interesting stories and, and actual experience with it to just come on and share whatever it is that they know. And it, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be into exactly what we're into. I mean, obviously this is kind of like a nuanced path, but if you're into like numerology, if you're into astrology, like all these different avenues of spirituality that clearly you're passionate about, that's the type of person we're looking to have on. So yeah. I just wanted to say I that. I haven't even dove into those topics yet. Well, that can be back on later down the line. <laughs> and we'll definitely have you on again, Colin. This was this was a great podcast. I think people are going to enjoy it. I think they so. are too. 
I definitely think they are too. And to everyone oh, yeah. watching, I wish you all a wonderful day, night, afternoon, wherever you are, and may your path be full of passion. Boom. That's it. Yeah.